All right, I think we are good to get started. Um, so hello everybody and welcome to this week's SEDS online webinar. As always, we'd like to thank our sponsors from IIS, which allows us to offer all of these resources free of charge. This includes recorded lectures, learning tools, and even virtual field trips. So take a look at our website and see what we have on there. It's always being updated. So today's lecture is by Dr. Amy Goff, who is a classic sedimentologist at Royal Holloway University of London. Dr. Goff got her master's and PhD degrees from Keele University. Her research interests include sedimentary provinces, basis analyses, depositional environment reconstruction, and the generation of roadmap GIS projects to support industry and hard to reach remote areas around Southeast Asia. So thank you very much for coming today and I'll hand over the floor to you. Thank you so much, Jermaine. And thank you so much for inviting me to talk today. I'm really looking forward to it. So um, today I am going to be talking about some work from around Southeast Asia, and in particular talking about how big data, so a lot of data, can help us to resolve regional paleo geographies in tropical climates. And the paleo geographies that I'm going to be presenting today have been developed using a lot of data uh, collected by members of the Southeast Asia Research Group here at Royal Holloway over the years. So a lot of the credit to the data that's being plugged into these models has to go to all of the members of the group, both past and present. Um, and we've had some fantastic people through the doors during that time. So what I really want to focus on today is the data itself over the paleogeographies, because I want to describe how using this data can allow us to overcome some of the difficulties we get in developing paleogeographical maps in these tropical areas, and in particular, areas that are quite tectonically active, like Southeast Asia. So this slide shows a digital elevation map of Southeast Asia. And I just wanted to highlight some of the key features that I'll be talking about throughout this presentation. So up here in the north, you can see mainland Southeast Asia. And this kind of elongated country here is Myanmar. And I'll be talking about some of our work that we've been doing in Myanmar a bit later. Down here, we have the Malaysian Peninsula. And then sitting just beneath it, we have Sumatra. Taking a nice central position, we have Borneo and just under that Java. Um, and then we have Sulawesi, the Bird's Head and the Philippines up here. This green area you can see on the DEM is uh, green because it's quite shallow. And we refer to this as Sunderland. And it's one of the more important areas of Southeast Asia in terms of the Cenozoic sedimentary basins that we have tried to reconstruct in terms of the paleogeographies. One of the main processes that we see going on throughout Southeast Asia is subduction and with this subduction related arcs. And you can see these arcs with quite nice lineations. And so this is the Barasan arc that cuts through Sumatra. This is the Sunder arc that cuts through Java. And then we have the Banda arc um, that has this kind of curved shape over here in the east. And just in front of the Banda arc, we have an incredibly deep basin um, in the present day called the Weber Deep. So there's everything in the area from mountainous, continental, shallow marine, all the way through to very deep marine settings. One of the most overlooked aspects of Southeast Asia is the sheer magnitude um, of the size of it. And people often consider it to be quite a small area because it's a collection of islands, and uh, when you travel there, you can often hop between the islands and visit a lot of Southeast Asia quite quickly. But this diagram I just wanted to show because it shows the extent of Southeast Asia overlain on the United States of America. And you can see that it has a very similar scale. So when we're talking about the paleogeographic reconstructions and a lot of the complexities that go into it, I want you to kind of picture um, how much ground they're really covering. And uh, from that, why there are some areas that need a bit of extra work and a bit of tweaking. 
This map also excludes the mainland area of Southeast Asia, um, such as Myanmar that I pointed out earlier. So in practice, it is an even bigger area. Southeast Asia itself is quite um, complex tectonically. It's formed from a series of continental blocks that have rifted from Gondwana and Caucasia. And there have been several different periods of rifting of these continental fragments away from the margins of Gondwana since the Paleozoic, with a final breakup occurring in the Cretaceous. And during the assembly of these continental blocks of Southeast Asia, subduction has always been the most important tectonic process. And we saw from the DEM that that still is very much true today. And the fact that subduction is the most important process has implications for our understanding of the geological record. So a lot of the geologic history has actually been destroyed over the years. Um, not to make broad brush and sweeping statements, but in very general terms, um, there, are key, there are three key events in the assembly of Southeast Asia. So the rifting and breakup of Gondwana, the northward movement of India, which began around 85 million years ago and collided finally around 35 million years ago. And the third event is the northward movement of Australia. And this has been ongoing since the Eocene and it is still colliding with Southeast Asia in the present day. Um, so it's these continental blocks that you can see on this map here and that rifted from both Gondwana and Caucasia that form the core of Southeast Asia. So from west to east, you have the Woyla Arc. So this is a volcanic arc that accreted to Sunderland in the Cretaceous. In the purple, we have West Sumatra and the Indochina East Malaya block. Um, and these rifted from Gondwana in the Devonium. You have Sibi Masu over here that sits over kind of Sumatra and Malaysia. Um, and then we have the dangerous grounds up here, and these rifted from Caucasia in the Mesozoic. And we also have a series of blocks that were derived from Australia in the late Jurassic. So you can see the Southwest Borneo block here, the East Java and West Sulawesi block, or Argo land as it's sometimes referred to, as well as the Sabah to North Sulawesi block. And these have um, kind of suture zones that are related to them as well. And then all the way over in the east, we have the fragmented Sula Spur. So this includes areas such as Bird's Head in West Papua and the islands of the Bandarak or some of the islands of the Bandarak, such as Baba and Tanimbar. So to this day, Southeast Asia remains incredibly active. So it was very active when all of these blocks were drifting into position. Um, and even to this day, it is still driven primarily by subduction. So this map shows the hypocenter depth of earthquakes around the region, and it really nicely highlights these um, subduction zones. So you can see where each of these hypocenters are plotted. This is a key area where we see subduction. Um, and this also shows that these subduction zones are the main driver of modern seismic hazards. We see a very similar thing with the distribution of our volcanoes around Southeast Asia, where they relatively unsurprisingly follow our subduction zones. So just to throw back to some of the arc features we saw on the digital elevation map earlier, we have the Barasan arc, so this forms a kind of backbone of the island of Sumatra. We have the Sunda arc, so that cuts through Java, as well as these small islands off to the east of Java and then the Bander arc that follows this curved line and follows this really deep bit of ocean, the weather deep. So the slip vectors of these tectonic plates, um, because they're still so tectonically active, um, highlight the speed at which the plates are moving and colliding with each other. So the plates around Southeast Asia are converging up to 90 millimeters a year, which is a huge amount. And this equates to almost 90 kilometers per million years. And just to put it in some context of the region, this is more than the distance from north to south 
of the island of Java. There's a massive amount of movement that we're seeing in a relatively short time span um, in terms of geology, of course. And these long-standing tectonic processes lead to various issues when we want to reconstruct the region tectonically. And because it leads to tectonic reconstruction issues, it leads to issues with reconstructing the paleogeography. So each of these issues I'm gonna talk about stand when we talk about the paleogeographies as well. So the main issue, of course, is that subduction has readily destroyed the geological record in multiple places around Southeast Asia. I also showed the map comparing Southeast Asia with the US. Um, so just to prove that it's a huge area, but it is relatively understudied. The literature can be quite patchy. That's due to areas uh, where it's quite difficult to access the geology. And of course, there are areas of a lot of really fantastic research as well. Um, there's a lack of critical data, and that's something that we're really trying to push towards resolving. And there's also a lot of controversies in the region. So um, because people have this patchy data, it's really difficult to make a conclusive argument. Um, so there's a lot of debate and a lot of controversies between all of these different reconstructions. So the, re the three reconstructions shown on this slide all come from relatively similar times in the Cenozoic. So the Rangan et al reconstruction from the 1990s um, shows what Southeast Asia would have looked like 32 million years ago. Um, so Rangan professes that this is quite a simplistic tectonic reconstruction. But just to kind of draw your eye in, this is Borneo here in the center, and then this is the bird's head down here in the south. The second reconstruction is the reconstruction by Robert Hall in 2002, um, and he ran the Southeast Asia Research Group up until his retirement last year. Um, it's a slightly larger scale, the reconstruction from Hall, but you can see Borneo here, and you can see the bird's head down here again in the south. The final reconstruction from 35 million years is by Zahirovich et al. in 2013. Again, it's a slightly broader scale than the Rangan reconstruction, but you can see Borneo here in the center and then the bird's head again down here in the south. And I just wanted to point out Borneo because there's a lot of debate about the rotation and location of Borneo um, through the Cenozoic. So you can see that each reconstruction has Borneo at a very different angle. As I mentioned at the beginning of this slide, the issues with the reconstructions and kind of the variations that we find poses a difficulty for reconstructing the paleogeographies. As the tectonic reconstructions need to be correct in order to accurately build the paleogeographical reconstructions on top of them, because it very much depends where our data's come from. But for the sake of the paleogeographies that I'll be showing throughout this talk, or at the end of this talk, they've been developed using the reconstructions from Robert Hall. So this is the one that we're going to be focusing on today. So getting in to the sedimentology around the region, because we are at SEDS online, um, it has a really interesting history in terms of sedimentation. Um, it has a generally low relief. However, the present day sediment yields are incredibly high. Um, I don't know how many of you were at Roman's talk the other week, but he mentioned that Taiwan, for example, is supplying the same amount of sediment as um, the whole of the United States. So there's areas around Southeast Asia that are pumping a lot of sediment into the system. Despite this, they are often overlooked in kind of global models of sediment supply or sediment yield. Um, one of the reasons for this is that we don't have huge rivers like we see in the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta, but we have these short rivers that are sourced directly from mountainous regions, and they only carry sediment a very short way into ocean setting. So here's a couple of pictures of these mountainous rivers. We have a nice tropical environment. So we have a monsoon season or a rainy season once a year. So most of the time, uh, these rivers have very small scale channels within a larger fluvial plain. But as soon as we hit the rainy season, these fill up. And as they fill up, the energy increases exponentially and you can carry a hell of a lot of sediment 
in um, these kind of short, but very, very wide rivers. And just to give you an idea of the energy of these rivers, this is a really, really well-constructed bridge. Um, it had really good and just one flood event took this entire bridge down or cambered it over in the river. So lots of energy, lots of sediment, but quite short rivers and not very well developed marginal marine settings. This map shows the estimated sediment yields from around Southeast Asia. So I just wanted to highlight a few bits of it. So New Guinea, the sediment yield is 1,756 megatons per year. Sumatra is also really high, so that's 783 megatons per year. The Philippines is sitting at 612, and then Borneo at 581. And even the areas that have a slightly lower sediment yield, it's still quite high. Um, and in total, our total sediment yield for Southeast Asia is around 5,000 megatons per year. So this means that Southeast Asia is providing about 25% of global sediment to the oceans. And just to compare this to the Himalayas, because I, as I said earlier, we view the Himalayas as an area that provides a lot of sediment into our system. So the combined total for the Brahmaputra, the Ganges and the Indus rivers is 2,140 megatons. So you can see that this is less than half of the sediment that's being supplied from the islands around Southeast Asia. And what's really interesting about this 25% figure is that Southeast Asia itself only makes up about 2% of global land area. Of course, one of the reasons that it does supply so much sediment is that there is just more coastline in Indonesia. So there's a lot more entry points for sediments to flush from these mountainous regions into the sea. Also, because we have a rainy season, we have periods of very high energy, so we can just carry more sediment through. We're learning more and more all the time about longer term sediment supply, so how sediment supply has grown. But we do know some really interesting things already. So we know that Borneo itself, even though it's on the lower end, has provided sediment at about the same rate per unit area as the Himalayas throughout the past 20 to 25 million years. And what this means is that we must have episodic tectonics that lead to kind of episodic uplift of our source areas. So we're always refreshing the amount of sediment that we can erode into these systems. So even though it has this relatively low relief, um, particularly when you look at it in comparison to the Himalayas, because you have constant uplift, you're constantly providing more sediment. We also see um, a huge amount of subsidence. So this diagram on the left shows a subsidence curve for the Salin Subbasin in Myanmar, the Malay Basin in Malaysia, and the Batani Basin in Thailand. Um, and this is taken from a paper by Hall and Morley in 2004. And I just wanted to focus on the uh, Myanmar Salin Subbasin because we'll talk about this in a bit more detail in a bit. Um, so you can see that the Myanmar Salin Subbasin subsided almost 18 kilometers over the past 60 odd million years. So a huge amount of subsidence. Compare this to our North Sea basins up here, you can see that they subsided around five kilometers in over 200 million years. So again, a very tectonically active area, but this is leading to a massive amount of accommodation space throughout the region. And because in the previous slides, I showed that we had a huge amount of sediment yield. It means that we have a huge thickness of sediment in our basin. So in the Salin subbasin, the sediment thickness preserved for just the Oligocene formations is around four kilometers. And that's not far off the entire accommodation space that was generated in the North Sea basins um, as a total. And this leads to a huge amount of sediment volume, of course. So in the Salin subbasin, there's almost 500,000 kilometers cubed of sediment preserved. And this means we get amazing preservation of the sedimentary record. So it's a fantastic place to go and unravel the Cenozoic because most of the sediment that's pumped in is preserved there. And this slide just shows the spread of these Cenozoic basins across Southeast Asia. 
So um, it's missing the Salin Subbasin, but this is the Batani Basin and the Malay Basin that was on the previous slide in terms of the subsidence diagram. And all this shows is that there's a lot of basins in the region. So there's a lot of areas that can capture our sediments. So really, we should have, in terms of the sedimentology, a very good record. Um, you can see that a lot of it is um, uh, marine basins now, in a marine setting. We don't have access to much core, which is uh, slightly problematic. Most of our research is done on land. So getting on to our data that we have in the Southeast Asia Research Group, um, we have over 40 years worth of data from onshore Southeast Asia and a few smatterings um, of offshore data, but of course not as much as we'd like. I am going to focus on the data itself uh, mostly, but I do want to say that fieldwork has been really key throughout this research. So these samples have been collected and the rocks of course have been studied in the field. The data shown on this map include our zircon sample locations. So this is where we have Uranian lead ages from zircons in the white dots. In the green dots, um, it shows where we have heavy mineral point counts from heavy mineral separates. The yellow is where we have ages from our foraminifera, which is great for biostratigraphy. Blue dots are where we have light minerals. The uh, purple dots show every PhD student that's been through the doors of the Southeast Asia Research Group, and then the orange dots are field reports. Um, I will hasten to add that in some instances, the field reports and the PhDs are kind of a best guess as to where you put them, because they're, they're usually regional projects. So it's kind of a pinpoint expressing roughly where they worked. There's also a lot of data that's not shown. So the sedimentology, such as the sedimentary logs, um, or the paleo currents and samples and thin section locations also aren't shown. Saying that, we have over 10,000 samples and 8,000 thin sections in our repository here at Royal Holloway. So if anybody is interested in working on the rocks of Southeast Asia, please get in touch because um, it's likely we might have samples from the area that you're interested in or prepared thin sections or even mineral separates. I just wanted to take a second to highlight an incredibly special thesis that we have, uh, just to prove that we've had some of the best researchers walk through our doors. Um, this is Stephen Lakier's thesis on the Miocene Wanasari formation on Java in Indonesia, looking at the volcanoclastic influences on carbonate platform development. And I hope the title is right, Stephen. One of the biggest challenges around Southeast Asia is to try and define a good stratigraphy. And this sounds like it should be quite a simple process, but unfortunately, there's a lot of debate over the different formations. Uh, it's different levels of extreme. So in Sumatra, for example, we see um, over 20 kilometers, uh, sorry, 20 different names for one individual formation. One of the most essential things that we do in order to unravel what's going on with the stratigraphy is to have a really good dating campaign. And traditional biostratigraphic methods are incredibly essential for defining our dating and for defining our stratigraphy. And of course, we really try to get a handle on the biostratigraphy everywhere we go. However, we also find that isotopic dating is really important. That's because we have so many magmatic rocks around um, and a lot of active arc settings as well. So we get some really good answers out of our isotopes. One of the things we've had great success with in terms of our isotopic dating is understanding the basement rocks. So many areas of basement rocks have never actually been dated. And the ages of these basement rocks have commonly been assumed based on things such as geological mapping, which are really good. But of course, if you haven't got samples and you haven't dated it, then you're just assuming from the geology where it sits in terms of the stratigraphy. So I just wanted to run through some of the exciting finds that we have. On Java, there's a series of Cretaceous accretionary melanges. Um, and these contain really, really old zircons. So we have our key and zircons in these accretionary melanges. 
In Kalimantan, there's pre-Triassic metamorphic rocks that contain Cretaceous zircons, so probably not pre-Triassic, probably a bit younger. In Sarawak, the pre-Carboniferous metamorphic rocks were actually dated to be Triassic and Cretaceous, so again, younger. In Sulawesi, the Cretaceous or Paleozoic metamorphic rocks actually turned out to be Pliocene. Um, this was really interesting because it meant that exhumation of these metamorphic rocks was absolutely astronomical. So they came up at an incredibly fast pace. And in Saram, the pre-Triassic basement was actually Neogene, so significantly younger. And it's all of these really interesting findings that help us to unravel and understand what's going on around Southeast Asia. As I mentioned, one of the key ways that we collect our data is through field studies. Often we're really lucky and we get fantastic exposure like the picture on the left hand diagram here, but mostly we have to get a bit creative with it. So sometimes we have to take boat trips around the islands to reach coastal outcrops. This picture is from um, Alfred Redouan, who now works at the Institute of Technology Banding, one of our PhD students. Um, and then this is a picture of a river hike. So often we have to walk up rivers in order to find scrappy bits of exposure. And that's because most of the places that we work look like this. So heavily vegetated, um, and sadly, in a lot of cases, the rainforest where there's still some rock preserved has now been raised and has been replaced with palm oil plantations, which are even more inaccessible and are obviously devastating for the local ecology as well. Um, I showed kind of the best pictures of working in the jungle, but more often than not, it looks like this. So we have rocks obviously in the river, but these are out of situ, and then really, really thick soils where there potentially could have been an outcrop at some point, but it has just weathered so heavily into these really, really thick tropical soils. So where we do do these field studies and we do get this, this data, it's still going to be a bit patchy because it depends on how far into these islands we can reach and the areas that we can access. And often it is confined to areas where there's rivers that we can walk up. I just wanted to show you a little bit of field data from Sumatra because everybody likes a bit of field work. We're just going to be focusing on the South Sumatra Basin down here in the south. So Sumatra itself is cut through by the Barisan Mountain. So this is one of the arcs that you could see on the digital elevation model earlier. And the South Sumatra Basin sits just um, to the east of this. And it's divided itself into a series of sub-basins. And these sub-basins throughout the Eocene and Oligocene had a series of lacustrine um, bodies within them. And there are instances where we do see really nice outcrops. So these are some interbedded sandstones and siltstones. The siltstones are volcanoclastic, um, so really nice for dating. And you can see these really large channels cutting down into these interbedded sandstones and siltstones. On the right-hand side, you can see these cross-bedded granule grade conglomerates from the Lahat formation. So we do have some very coarse sediments here as well. Um, we're really lucky to have such fantastic collaborators um, out in Southeast Asia. So this is Pat Budi from Sirajaya University in Palembang itself. Um, and he can take us to see all of the best outcrops for sampling because otherwise they tend to look like this. So this is just a pile of clay. And whilst you can probably get a bit of interesting information out of it, it's not really useful for the kind of stuff we do in the Southeast Asia research group. So it wouldn't give us much information for example, into the sedimentary provenance, and um, we couldn't get much mineralogy out of it. And all of the sedimentary structures are pretty much destroyed. But with this patchy data, we can start to reconstruct very localized um, depositional environment models. So this is just a model of one of these deep rifted lacustrine basins. And what we can see from the sedimentology is over on the west, we have our steep rift shoulder, and from our steep rift shoulder, we're just shedding alluvial fans and fan deltas directly into our lacustrine body. And over in the east, we have the shallower rift shoulders, and we see these kind of mixed fan deltas and fluvial deltas shedding off of our shallower rift shoulder. 
And all of these interact with our lacustrine sediments in the basin centre. In terms of our provenance, this is quite simple because it's all just locally sourced from the basement of Sumatra. So it's these settings that are quite easy to rationalise and unravel. Moving on to our databases, um, I'm going to kick start with our light mineral database. Um, so each of these blue dots are the, is the location of one of the samples. So there's 843 samples in total. These are all thin sectioned and stained in order to differentiate between quartz and feldspar really easily down the microscope. There's been 421,500 grains counted. And the information is, of course, georeferencing, so the location, but also the rock type, grain size, rounding and sorting, age and formation. Um, in the light mineral point counts, it's quartz, feldspars and lithics that are focused on alongside the percentage of matrix and cement but also any more exotic um, grains that are also highlighted because that helps us identify the samples we want to process for heavy minerals. And after we've point counted our light mineral slides, we plot them on one of these Garzy Dickinson QFL diagrams. So on the left here, we have our QFL. So at the top, we have our quartz. At the bottom left, we plot our feldspar. And on the bottom right, we plot our lithics. If we had a sample that had 100% quartz in it, it would plot right up here, um, just to explain to you how it will look in terms of the plotting. With our QMFLT, we subdivide our quartz up. So this is just monocrystalline quartz, and our polycrystalline quartz gets thrown in with our lithics. So the LT stands for total lithics because it includes this polycrystalline quartz. Feldspar remains the same. And these QFL diagrams are absolutely fantastic. They're wonderful models, um, but they were developed in temperate North America. So we do see a huge amount of limitations when we start to apply them to tropical environments. And this is one of the first sort of hiccups that we find when we want to do a true provenance study, that a lot of the models or a lot of the techniques that we use were developed in temperate North America so they don't necessarily apply perfectly to Southeast Asia. This is just an example from Borneo. Um, I'm using Borneo because it's the country or the island that we have the most data from. You can see that the majority of samples plot up here in the recycled origin section on our QFL diagram. But the majority of samples have actually been sourced from metamorphic basement, a series of granites called the Schwana granites and cratonic material as well. So you would expect it to be plotting more in this quadrant. Plotting it on the QMFLT rationalizes this slightly, but we still have a huge amount of our samples plotting in our recycled origin. And one of the reasons for this is that as soon as we're in a tropical environment, instead of a temperate or arid environment, we see the preferential breakdown of our feldspars. So our feldspar breaks down not only during transport, but we also see orthogenesis of our feldspars into clays during burial. There are some areas where QFL diagrams do work. So Halmahira is a small island that sits between Sulawesi and the bird's head. And here it is just arc material and ophiolitic material. There's no continental material being pumped in at all. Um, and this is some work by Kaznama in 1998. So you can see that where we don't have quartz, we do get a kind of reliable plot. But of course, most of the time we do have quartz and we see something similar to this. So I mentioned at the beginning that the majority of Southeast Asia is governed by subduction in terms of tectonic processes. And we have a lot of arc material related to this subduction. So we would expect a huge amount of our samples to be plotting down in our dissected transitional and undissected magmatic arc areas. The three diagrams at the top are all from Borneo. So there's the Kuchin zone um, and North Borneo, which are both North Borneo, and then Kalimantan, which is the Indonesian side of Borneo down in the south. There's the Banda Arc, which are these curved islands um, just next to the Weber Deep, and then North Sumatra sits around here. And you can see that despite expecting a lot of our samples to plot in our magmatic arc sections, 
they are all forced up into our more quarter-inch section. So we're definitely seeing something going a bit wrong when we try to apply QSL. One of the other issues is the fact that there's a volcanism at all. So previously, these very quartz-rich sandstones were considered to have solely been eroded from really old continental regions. This is some work from Helen Smith in 2008, and she spent quite a lot of time looking at quartz and found that the majority of quartz on, these are from Java, um, so the majority of quartz on Java was very volcanic. And this meant that our samples were very compositionally mature, so they plot as very quartz rich, but they're texturally immature. So this is just another misapplication of QFL. So when you use it, you want to be aware of the climate at the time of deposition and the amount of volcanism in the region. This is our heavy mineral database. So we have 403 samples here with 140,095 grains counted. And we um, keep the information on the age and the formation, as well as every single heavy mineral counted, so the signature and the heavy mineral ratios as well. I just wanted to flash up the fact that we don't just optically point count heavy minerals because that can be a little bit tricky or you can introduce quite a lot of user bias on the microscope. We've started to support our heavy mineral data by Raman spectroscopy. We do this at the University of Gottingen in Germany. And just to talk you through this slide, um, each of these ovals is an individual heavy mineral separate. And each of these purple dots is an individual grain that's been counted. So this allows us to collect a lot of data in a very short period of time. This data is then run through a neural net that's developed by Dr. Kano Lundsdorf at Gottingen, and it matches the spectra with the best match of mineral. And then it gives you a confidence value. So you don't just assume that everything's correct. The way they prep them are also really good because you can take the individual grains and you can optically analyze them. So we double check all of the sides to make sure that the Raman isn't biasing it. And you can also take this slide and you can put it on the LA LAIC PMS. So you can date your zircons for uranium leads in situ. You can also take it and you can shove it straight on the microprobe. So you can look, for example, at different types of garnet and you can start to source match your different types of garnet in your heavy mineral separate, provided you know exactly where they have come from or where you'd expect different types of garnet to come from. So I just wanted to talk through one of the heavy mineral studies that we've done in Myanmar. So we're going back to the Salian subbasin. So this is the really deep basin um, that we saw in that substance curve. And we're going to focus on the Schwezator and Padau formations, which are kind of younger Oligocene in age. And when we've point counted the heavy minerals, we get a graph that looks a bit like this. So this is from a paper by McNeil um, in 2021, looking at the heavy minerals and provenance of these formations here, so the Schwezator and the Padau. And you can start to see some significant switches in our heavy mineral signature. So between the lower Schwezator and the middle Schwezator, you can see that we have an increase in the amount of garnet. Um, you see an introduction of chloratoid, and you also see an introduction of chrome spinel and titanite. And this is really interesting because we have a suite of ophiolites in Northern Myanmar that probably became available as a source at around this time. We also see a potential switch between the lower Padau and the middle Padau formation. The biggest thing you can identify here is that we see an enrichment of our zircon, our tourmaline, and our rutile heavy minerals. And this is important because these are our ultra stables. These remain intact um, regardless of how much transportation and burial a sample has gone through. So we probably have a switch into a relatively more mature system at this point. In order to double check this, we can have a look at the ratios of our heavy minerals against each other. So you can still see this switch between the lower Schwezator and the middle Schwezator. So you can see that our ratios are kind of kicking off. You can see this most dramatically with our rutile zircon index ratio. And you can see a switch again between the lower Padau and the middle Padau. 
What is really interesting as well is that we see a second switch in the Padal when we're just looking at our ratios between the middle and upper. So with our garnet zircon one, it kicks all the way back um, on itself. Same with appetite, tourmaline, same with rutile zircon, and same with our ZTR as well. So lots of information you can draw out of this. And all of this data is used together to develop really localized paleo environment interpretations or small um, gross depositional environment maps. So this work is done by Connor McMillan in 2019 as part of his MRES project um, in the process of becoming a paper, I hope. Um, so you can see that we have these southerly flowing fluvial systems in the Salin subbasin, and they deflect in a westward manner um, into the Bay of Bengal. And we see a very similar thing throughout the entire Oligocene, so the Schwezator, Padau, and Omental formation. And this is a really interesting result because the Indo-Myanmar ranges over here on the west were assumed to have uplifted in one event. But because we start to see a small amount of sourcing from the Indo-Myanmar ranges in the early Oligocene, we know that this uplift must have been episodic. So we must have had a small amount of uplift in the north, which allowed these river systems to still leak through. And then the rest of the IMR must have come up at a later date. And when you look at the DEM for the region, you do see a dog leg at that point. Moving on to our uranium lead zircon ages, here we have 576 samples with 36,864 zircons analyzed. Here we have the age and formation, of course, as well as the uranium lead zircon ages, including the maximum depositional age. Um, it's not unheard of that we get a maximum depositional age. It's a lot younger than we expect um, it to be in relation to the age of the formation. So we do get some really interesting results here, similar to the results we had in the basin. These are some CL zircon images from the Nicobar fan, so some offshore work, just to include it. This is from Web et al. in 2021. This is some work we did um, on some IODP core there. I just wanted to flash this up because you can see quite nicely that you have a differentiation between the core and the rim of your zircons. And this is really important when you're dating them because you need to know if you're dating your potentially older core or your potentially younger rim. And having these CL images or these cathode luminescence images allows you to target where on these grains you're dating. And we can map the changes in our zircon ages regionally across Southeast Asia. So we can start to identify smaller scale changes throughout the region. So on the left here, we have our zircon age plots. We've got total number of analysis on the left of this, age along the base, and then the total number of zircons analyzed up here. So where it says N equals 193, that means that 193 zircons have um, been analyzed. The plots on the left run from the Cenozoic to the Ordovician, and on the right, we have our Proterozoic and Archean. And these have slightly different scales. This just allows our zircon signature or our age signature to be nice and clear. And we can start to pick up um, really interesting peaks here. So we have our Cretaceous peak, um, we have our Cenozoic peak, we have a Triassic peak, and you can start to see that these peaks are occurring in not just one island, but across multiple islands. So our Triassic peak occurs in North Borneo, West Borneo, West Java, as well as Sumatra, but is completely missing from East Java. And we can also see some similarities in our Proterozoic zircon as well. So we can start to use this to trace where the source areas for these zircons might be sitting. So just to use a couple of these as an example, where we have our Triassic zircons, we could assume that they might be coming from the tin belt granites that sit around Malaysia and offshore Sumatra in Bangka and Bilatung. Where we have Cretaceous zircons, these might be coming from the Shwana granites in Borneo. Even better if you have some heavy minerals that suggest metamorphic rocks as well, because these are intercalated with the Pinot metamorphics. And if you're in the South China Sea and you see Paleozoic to Mesozoic ages, you might want to start looking at a potential Indochina source 
So it's just using this knowledge and the dating of the basement to try and track back the depositional pathways throughout the Cenozoic. It also pays to bear in mind that there's a lot of recycling of zircon grains throughout Southeast Asia. So after we've had deposition um, of these older zircons as parts of a younger sedimentary unit, and then that's reworked. So uh, pay attention to that. The final database that plays in to our paleogeographies and the one that I spend the least time on, I'm ashamed to admit, is the Foraminifera database. So here we have 1,092 samples. Each of these samples are georeferenced. Uh, the fossils that occur in each sample are recorded, as well as the age, the microfasces, and the depositional environments. We use fantastic experts in Foraminifera to give us all of these answers, such as Marcel at UCL. And um, she has spent years working with this in Southeast Asia, so she's really good at recognizing the specific fossils there. So we'll send her a slide and she'll send us all this fantastic data back, such as the fossils that she's found, the epoch, so in this case, we're looking at the late Oligocene, the period, such as the Paleogene, the microfasces, um, and uh, importantly, the depositional environments as well. And as you can imagine, these are really integral when we're plugging them in to our paleogeographies. Forams can also give us some really cool stories. So this is some more work by Webb, uh, this time in 2019. And here he used forams to date arc continent collision in Northwest New Guinea. So the foram dating revealed a hiatus in deposition at the Miocene to Pliocene boundary. And this separates the heavily deformed core formation, so the Miocene core formation, with the very undeformed Pliopleistocene Ocumari formation. So it's not just depositional environments um, that they can give us, it can also date some really nice stuff. So I just wanted to show a very quick blueprint before I move on to the actual paleogeographies in the last few minutes of this talk, just to show you how they're constructed. So they're not just kind of eyeballed. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, the tectonic reconstructions are the ones from Robert Hall. You can see on the Monet Peninsula, um, it's a highland. This is because we have fish and track data from appetites that show rapid uplift of the area at that time. In Sumatra, we have field observations such as sedimentary logs, fasces analysis, paleocurrents that tell us the main deposition was fluvial lacustrine. We have paleontological finds such as fish fossils found in the Eocene sediments in West Sumatra. And of course, we have all of our foraminifera. So each of these orange spots are a foraminifera from the late Eocene. And here we can get our depot environments and microfashions. And these are used alongside our heavy and light mineral analysis. So this tells us where these depositional systems have come from and the routing pathway that they've taken to get to the sink. So in the Eocene, the late Eocene, the depositional environment was predominantly marine. But we do have some highlands present around the Barasan Arc, the Malay Peninsula, and between Borneo and the Tuna. And the main sedimentary record of the basins that we find around these highs is alluvial fan, fluvial, and lacustrine. By the Oligocene, we see a lot more emergent land and the development of a series of deep rift lacustrine basins. And these occurred all the way across Sunderland. They're a very dominant feature. Because of the emergent land, there's an increase in terrestrial deposition through alluvial and fluvial environments. And we also see um, numerous carbonate platforms start to pop up. And these are still a dominant environment today. By the Miocene, the majority of the highlands and islands were surrounded by these carbonate platforms and reefs. And the emergent land areas start to resemble present day Sunderland apart from a few areas such as the Ntutuna Arch um, and Borneo were connected as a highland at the time. Java, Sulawesi, West Papua and the Philippines were all shallow marine apart from, for, apart from some small volcanic islands in the area. So a large data focused approach can really help us to understand the paleogeographic um, reconstructions of Southeast Asia. And I will stress that this isn't exhaustive. This is just based on data from the Southeast Asia Research Group. There's a kind of initial playing with this data, and there's a lot more data from the literature to be brought in. 
but it does allow for very evidence-based models to be made by stepping back and stepping out of kind of current knowledge. These use an integral combination of biogeography and lipogeography, and fieldwork and dating of these deposits are key, especially when we're working out the stratigraphy of the region. So thank you so much for listening to this talk, and if there's time, I look forward to any questions. Sorry for overrunning a bit. No, that was great. Thank you very much. Certainly a lot of information. Um, so just so everybody knows, the chat is now open. So feel free to type your questions into the chat. Uh, tell us where you're from. And I will read them out to Amy and hopefully she can answer all of your questions. Um, I just had a question, maybe to kick things off. Um, with the QLF diagrams, have you or your group thought of sort of remaking them to fit tropical climates? We haven't, I must admit, but there's some fantastic work um, from people around the globe trying to resolve this. Um, so the guys at Lauven, KU Lauven in Belgium have done a lot of work making them 3D so you can rationalize losing the feldspar. Um, they're quite nice, but they're still not perfect enough to really pinpoint mm -hmm. stuff in Southeast Asia. And I think that's just because we have more variables that can even fit on a 3D plot, just with the volcanism and the breakdown of the feldspars. But it would be lovely yeah. to be able to create it. Yeah, it would probably be a very useful tool. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have a question in the chat from Stephen in Derby. Hi, Amy. Thanks for the excellent talk. How well do you think the methods and lessons learned in the Southeast Asia mega data study can be applied to another region, so Central America or the Caribbean? I think it would be great to do something in Central America, just because the data is in such good order and there's been years and years and years of research in Central America. Um, I think in terms of the lessons learned, there are definitely things that maybe you should focus less on. So we've spent a lot of time focusing on our light minerals, for example. And whilst this is great for working out the type of sediment that we've got, and it's been really good for the studies that the group have been doing and um, to reconstruct really localized sedimentology, when you start to plug that data into these regional models, it starts to fall apart and they're not really used that much in terms of the paleogeographic studies. So I think the main lessons to take away are to think about your data before you start plugging it into models, because there's a lot of stuff that you can save a lot of time not considering. And that would be the biggest takeaway, the QFL. All right, the next question is from Maria in uh, Svalbard, Norway. Thanks for the great talk. Which processes do you have in place to make sure that data keeps getting into these da amazing databases? So currently it's just from our own students. So we do um, have, a lot of data in the literature as well. We have a huge repository of data um, that we're trying to work through and plug in. Um, so it's just through having a lot of projects, a lot of students, um, even incorporating it into undergraduate projects where possible, um, and just trying to chip away at our 10,000 rocks in our rock store to make sure every single sample we've collected doesn't get wasted. So we're constantly um, collecting more data and constantly plugging it in. And hopefully that continues. I kind of have another question sort of jumping off of uh, Stevens. Is there, so you said that you focused a little bit too much maybe on the light minerals. Is there any other sort of data that you would like to focus more on? I think going in hard on the heavy minerals would give us quite a lot of information. So up to quite recently, we've only really looked at the zircons, occasionally some appetites, and the overall heavy mineral point count. So you can get fantastic data from titanites, from garnets, um, from all of them really. And sometimes when you spend so long creating these separates, I do feel like maybe, we're, maybe we've been missing a lot of the data that we could have been drawing out from all of this work, separating them in the first place. So that would be a big thing that going back, I would focus on more. Right. Um, so if anyone else has any questions, just feel free uh, to put them in the chat, but now I have another one. <laughs> um, 
So you don't have very much marine coverage. Would you really like to do some coring in that area? And sort of, if you did do those marine cores, what do you think they might tell you? I think they would answer a lot of questions. So we have three main projects only on core. We have the IEDP core from the Bay of Bengal, and then we've just had two PhD students that have recently finished looking at bore off core off the coast of Northern Borneo. And they have allowed us to redefine the stratigraphy of onshore, offshore Borneo and really work out routing pathways. So um, where we've assumed that big rivers have been taking sediment in from certain places, it's actually switched by 90 degrees. Um, so I think there's a lot of answers in the mm -hmm. offshore. It's just getting access to core. One of the um, biggest issues is that core around Southeast Asia has been kept outside. So you see weathering as a core. Um, so a lot of the data is lost when you try and go and subsample it, which is a huge shame. Mm -hmm. Oh no. <laughs> we have a, um, another question from Ross Campbell in Kingston, Canada. Uh, fascinating talk, thank you. Is there any work on present day sediment load, detrital mineralogy and dissolved species that might help with the Providence attempting uh, with the QLF approach or et cetera? Yeah, so we've had quite a look, uh, quite a close look at our feldspars and feldspar dissolution. Um, and I know the guys at UCD, so in Dublin, have spent quite a lot of time looking at feldspar dissolution as well. So it is definitely possible to spend a lot of time with each sample and you can work out how much of your feldspar is missing. And then you can modify your QFL based on that. Um, in terms of having so much data to go through, um, it's something that I would love to do, but I guess it's a time, a time issue there to do it. But it's a really, really, really good point. Our next question is from Roman in Usan. Uh, hi, Amy. Very good talk. Thanks. As you pointed out, that the sedimentary sequences are quite complete given the huge sediment, or sorry, the high sedimentation rate that occurs in Southeast Asia. Have you looked at the potential impact of climate cycles on sedimentation? Uh, yes. So, particularly the younger stuff, so the onset of the East Asian monsoon has massively picked up the amount of sediment that's being pumped into these basins. Um, not a lot of numerical work on it. Your talk the other week was really fascinating. So it would be really good to talk to you about some of the stuff that you've been doing with climate and sedimentation um, around Southeast Asia as well. But it's a really good point and it's definitely something to look into a lot further. All right. Uh, well, I think there's no more questions in the chat. Uh, so you might just start wrapping things up. So thank you again, Amy, for that awesome uh, talk. And uh, please join us next week at a regular time, uh, 4 p.m. UK time, for the SEDS Online student webinar, New Insights into Biogenic Controls on Sedimentation. So I hope to see everybody there.